And um, so glad that you're here tonight, and I'm so glad to have Brother David and Sister Debbie Price with us, who I have known now for a number of years. If memory serves me right, I think I remember him coming to preach for Daryl Glass way back in the day, maybe, in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, I would have been a teenager back then, so that's been a day or two ago. But I know he had on cowboy boots. <laughs> Are y'all with me? And uh, so I've, I've known David over the years, and everywhere he's gone, he's always been successful, and he's always been faithful, and he's always grown the church. I remember when he was uh, uh, our ministry's coordinator in South Georgia, uh, we had a, a big church in the denomination that was really struggling, and uh, they made an appeal for money from the state office, and we were in our old building still, and I remember calling and pledging $1,000. We didn't have $1,000, and I remember talking to Sister Debbie, and uh, she said to me, she said, Brother Mike, I can tell you this. Over the years, me and David have given when we didn't have it to give, and God has always turned it around and brought it back some way, somehow. I told somebody just the other day, and I, we've already received the offering, so don't get in a panic. <laughs> told somebody the other day, I said, you know, I wish I had known 20 years ago or more the blessings of giving that I truly realize today. I had a chance to be with uh, Brother Wayne Swanson uh, speaking up at his, his son pastors of church there in Statesboro now. But I remember he told me years ago when I was in Claxton, he said, Mike, if you can give to those who cannot give back, you'll see God bless you again and again and again. And you know, if I had really known that and really had that peace about that kind of giving back then, I'd have dumped the coffers out. I'm not, I'm not kidding you. And God has truly blessed us. So thank you. You're a giving church. And, uh, you know, I said this on Sunday, but I'll say it again. In October, we just now, I can't believe it's already 6th of November, but in October, 39 people give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ here at the harbor. 39 people. Already 11 people last Sunday. 11 people, and we baptized 22 in water. Um, God is doing something phenomenal. He's doing something great. So um, Brother David is just a great preacher of the gospel. I've heard him a few times over the years, uh, particularly at camp meeting just a few years ago, and just knocked it out of the park. And uh, I want him to come and just bless your heart, and he knows my heart. That is just obey the Lord, and he ain't nothing but a country boy, and you're going to know that two seconds after he takes the mic. Come on, Brother David, and just obey the Lord. God bless you. Make him welcome, would you? Well, how y'all doing? <laughs> hey, Lord. I met somebody last week on the hunting club that talked more country than me. Made me so mad I couldn't hardly stand it. It's good to be here with you tonight, and Pastor, thank you for inviting me to come and be a part of this uh, Wednesday night revivals. It's good to know that the Lord shows up on Wednesday nights. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. And uh, Richard, that's not 70 years. Thank you very much. It's 69 years and three months. <laughs> I may not be the best speaker you've had here for these, but I promise I'm probably the oldest one. Amen. But uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be able to be here. And when the pastor uh, asked me if I would come, I told him I certainly would. And he said, now, I want to tell you we want camp meeting style. So he's putting a lot of pressure on an old man tonight, but we're going to do our best to have church. I've already had church tonight. Amen. This singing is so great and wonderful, I don't know how you stand it. I, I just don't believe I could take it every Sunday. I'd have to miss once in a while. I just don't believe I could take this good singing. And all of this tonight is just, it's more than singing, it's ministering. I go to a lot of churches, and the Lord opens a lot of doors, and and uh, I'm thankful for that. But some of it is just singing and some of it's ministering. And uh, I, love, I love songs that minister to me. And we probably all fought some battles. We may be in some battles tonight. But aren't you glad to know 
that he's going to see us through these battles, and we're going to come out on the other side. Amen. So uh, it's good to be here. I want to share with you a little bit tonight. I, I really, uh, uh, Debbie, she said, David, they need to know what you're preaching. I said, I do too. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, uh, here's one. And she said, well, I'm going to call. I said, no, hold on a minute. Give me a little more time. And I said, here's one. And finally, I don't know if she, it was yesterday or the day before, I finally, you know, felt led of the Lord to, to do what I'm going to do tonight. And uh, I want to warn you, I'm not the same preacher I was when I was here last. And that's been a little while ago. It was uh, this August was a year ago because I just leaving the state office and and pastor come up and said, I want you to come preach. And I want, and I said, sure, I'll come preach. And a little while later, he texts me. We was at camp meeting. He was sitting right by me, and he texts me. <laughs> said, can you come August the 24th? I said, yeah, I can. I texted him back. I'm just kidding about him sitting right by me. He was two rows behind me. But anyway, that's the way younger people do. They, they text, you know. But anyway, I'm glad I'm here, and I'm ready to have some more church. And let me say again, thank you for this good singing tonight. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh within us. Isn't that a wonderful verse of Scripture? Now unto him who is able to do. Well, you know, when... when if, if let's just put it like this, and I thought about this myself. If I had picked up the Bible for the very first time and opened this and just read this one verse of Scripture, now unto him I might be wondering, well, who's him? And that's what I want to preach on tonight, him. Who is him? And, you know, preparing for this message tonight, I, I thought, I said, Lord, I'd like to be really profound I've never been that in my life, so I thought I'd like to be really profound and, and sound like I know what I'm talking about, and so I Googled. It's a wonderful thing. And I, I Googled up him, thought I'd get something deep and profound so I could just, just you know, just blow your minds tonight. That redneck come in here, and he is so profound. And, I, and so Google tells me him is a certain male or male animal. That's all it said. A certain male or a certain male animal. Him. I said, that's not going to do. So I went on, scrolled on down. Have you ever done that? You just mash that thing and it'll run on down to something else. And I, and I read and it said that him at one time was a rock group. And I thought, well, now let me just start deducing some things here. And I really come up really quickly that I don't think Paul was talking about a rock band. So he's talking about him. So I want to talk to you a little bit about him tonight. Now Paul is writing from prison. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. Ephesus church is going through some difficult times. They are a struggling church living in a really corrupt city and world of that time. City of Ephesus, matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 15 and 32, Paul said, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. And you read in Acts chapter 19, and you'll see some of the stuff that Paul went through and dealt with in Ephesus. And I might get a little bit of that in a moment. But there was a materialistic city, it was an immoral city, it was a corrupt city, it was a heathenistic city. They had no room and they had no place for one true and living God. Matter of fact, there were many gods there. There were temples and monuments and statues to different kinds of false gods in Ephesus. We live in a very difficult time today. We live in a world, and I, I've, I've said this recent times. I preached Sunday night, fight the good fight of faith, and I said there's a battle coming. We're seeing things take place today that we never thought would take place. We are living in a corrupt society. 
We're living in a time when the church is going through some difficulties. It seems like everywhere we turn, somebody is trying to silence the church. I don't like that, do you? It's going to take some men and women and young people of God that's going to stand up. They were going through some difficulties there, and Paul is writing to this church that at one time was the largest church. It was kind of like the mother church. It was the influential church. Paul's writing to them from prison trying to encourage them. And before we get to chapter 3, verse number 20, Paul tries to encourage them and to remind them of who they are and their position in Christ Jesus. In chapter 1, verse number 1, he calls them faithful saints. Even though they're living through difficult times of immorality and all the, the, the politics of their day, and even going through some personal persecution and pain, he says, in all of this you are still the faithful saints of God. In chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, he speaks to them there with these encouraging words, and he says that, that you have been through God has predestined you through adoption by Christ Jesus according to his good pleasure. He is saying that God has brought you into his family because it was his will and good pleasure to do that. And then we get in verse number 7 of that first chapter, and he reminds them that they have redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood is the foundation of the gospel church. Amen. That whatever comes against us, we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 2, verse number 8, he tells him there that you are saved not, you are saved by grace and not by faith or your works. It is the gift of God. That what you have, you haven't earned and you certainly haven't deserved. But God has given you salvation as a gift unto you. And then in chapter 2, verse 18, he says that you have access to God. Isn't it wonderful to know when you're going through it, when you're going through the battles and the struggles of this life, when the world is pressuring you, you have access to God. My grandson is my pastor, and I heard him here a while back. We hadn't been there lately, and we've been out preaching. But he says there's no hope in the Pope. I hope that don't offend anybody here. But I'm thankful that I don't have to go in a booth behind a dark curtain and confess my sins or, or request anything. I have access to God. He knows my name, amen. You see, when I walk in there, he knows it's David, amen. I have access. You have access. And if you're going through something, let me tell you something else. You don't have to make an appointment either. All you got to do is get on bended knees and cry out to a heavenly Father, and you're ushered into the throne room of grace. Amen. You have access to God. And then verse 19 of that second chapter, he says, You're no more foreigners or strangers, but you are of the household of God, that we become a family. And there's something about family uh, that we need to take comfort in. Amen. So he's encouraging them before he gets to the third chapter, verse 20. Now we get to our text tonight. Isn't it wonderful when a pastor actually gets back to his text? It's a rare thing, isn't it? Amen. Uh, anyway, now unto him, and I looked at that. Well, who is him? I want to try to describe him just a little bit to you tonight. Who is him? First of all, I would say that he is the creator of all things. You understand what I'm saying? He is the creator of all things. In Genesis 1 and 1, well, hold, let me back up. Sometimes I get so excited that I get ahead of myself. Him. Why did he use the term him here? Well, it was in contrast to her. Now, ladies, hang on there. I'm not about to bash you. But you see, in that city of Ephesus, there was a temple that was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was a temple of Diana. It was a luxurious building. It was structured. It had ivory. It had gold. I mean, it was a very beautiful. It was the largest temple built unto a heathen god. And in that was, the, was Diana. Now, he is saying him because it's contrast to her. Her never did anything. Her was built by man. 
her was a myth. There is no record where her, Diana, ever raised the dead. He never, she never took a lad's lunch and fed 5,000. She never walked on the water. She never walked up to a coffin and raised up the dead. She never put food on nobody's table. She never put a, a, a seed in a woman's womb. See, her is the contrast to him. Him is the creator of all things. Genesis 1. One and one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, not Diana. You see, the Bible tells us in St. John chapter 1, the first three verses, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and there was not anything made that was made. He made it all. Not some things, not most things. He made all things. Uh, he made the big things and the little things. Amen. Isaiah, I'm going to preach in a minute now. Isaiah 66 and 1, uh, it says, Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 and 26, the earth's the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns everything. Uh, he didn't have to put his brand on a cattle of a thousand hills. He's the owner. He didn't have to carve his initials in the sunset. He's the owner. He didn't have to put his picture in the snowflakes that fall. He's still the owner. He didn't have to co-sign with you on your mortgage for your home. He's still the owner. His name may not be on your checkbook, but he's still the owner. He owns absolutely everything. Acts 17 and 28, it says, In him we live and move and have our being. Uh, he is the owner of all things because he created all things. She didn't. Not only is he creator of all things, he has all power. Matthew 28, 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Not some power, not most power, but all power. All power belongs unto him. Let me tell you about his beginning. You see, in the beginning we find out that he came down the stairways of heaven. He was born in Bethlehem, raised up in Nazareth, baptized in the Jordan, healed multitudes the side of the road, healed multitudes without medicine, and made no charges for his services. He has all power in this world. Men have often forgotten about his power, and they've challenged him. In his infancy, he was challenged. Men have tried to destroy him. But if you're going to come against him, let me ask you, what are you going to use for power? If you use the wind, he'll rebuke it. It'll lay down at his feet. If you use the water, he'll walk on the water. If you use fire, he'll take the heat out of it, and it'll refuse to burn. If you use the seal of an empire, he'll break it. If you use the cross, he'll bear it. If you use the grave, he'll rise from it. If you use death, he'll defeat it. He has all power in heaven and on earth. That's good news because whatever you're facing, it don't matter what you're facing, who you're facing, how much you're facing, he has all power to conquer all things. Amen. Somebody give the Lord some praise in this house. Well, I'm about to get all Pentecostal up in here. Amen. He has all power. There's nothing he can't do. I'm, a, I'm just going to give you, I'm not going to go through some stuff. I've been going through a little battle myself. And I was going through some physical pain. I'm talking about some pain. And I get down on the floor at my house. I'm down in the fetal position. And I'm praying. And I'm pray, here's what I'm praying. I'm saying, oh, God, would you just take the pain away? Oh, God, would you just take the pain away? And it was like God just spoke into my arm, my ear and said, what are you asking for? I'm asking you to take the pain away. He said, why are you asking me to patch you up? Why don't you ask me to heal you up? Amen. Don't ask me for these little things. Uh, don't just stop with just pain. Go to the source of that pain. Amen. We serve a big God. Sometimes when we're down here on this earth and going through the trials and tribulations, we forget how big our God is. We think sometimes this thing against me is bigger than God. 
He might be bigger than you, but I promise you it's not bigger than God. He has all power. So then we get down. Well, now we're going to get back to the text. Isn't that wonderful? Now unto him who is able. Well, again, I want to be impressive. So I looked up able. Not Cain and Abel, Abel. It means qualified, skilled. Abel means qualified, skilled, and capable. Paul is saying now unto him who is qualified, capable, and skilled. I thought about that just a moment. I thought, Abel. How can I really get this across, Abel? And I thought about Daniel chapter 3. You know this as well as I do, probably better. They Shadrach, Meshach, and Noshach. Remember them? These were three Hebrew boys that Nebuchadnezzar had pulled away from home. These guys were, were moving up the ladder in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar might have been mean, but he wasn't stupid. He knew these Jewish boys were smart. And he got the cream of the crop and wanted to put them into his government. He favored them. And, and, and jealousy came. Lord, there's some jealousy in the church. When you start getting blessed, somebody's going to get jealous. But that Mike Saints down there in Kingland, he's, He's let he's growing, yeah, but he's letting all the standards down. He's got smoke going. He's got lights dimmed out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Get ready, Mike. They're going to talk to you about that. Just keep on doing what you already have. I knew they had. Just keep on doing what you're doing. There's no reason to hang around naysayers, amen? You just, it must be working in here, amen? And so, <clears throat> those Babylonian guys, they were a little jealous, and they said, well, we'll fix them. Because these guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had some integrity about them. They might have been in Babylon, but Babylon wasn't in them. And they went to the king and said, oh, king, we're going to have a special day for you. Everybody likes a special day, don't they? We're going to have this great day. It's, it's King Appreciation Day. We're going to have a statue, big old statue built for you. We're going to have that day and we're going to bring, we're going to have chicken dumplings, we're going to have pig's feet, we're going to have collard greens, lima beans. I mean, we're going to blow it out, King. But we're going to honor you and we're going to all bow to you. When the music sounds off, we're going to all bow. Them guys do, Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo wasn't about to bow. Thank God they some folks ain't going to bend nor bow. Might burn, but we ain't bending or bowing. Oh, King, so everything gets ready and everything's going, man. They've been eating up. They've been having a good time and... All of a sudden, the music started blasting away, and you could hear people's knees hit the cement. Boom! And they all start bowing to this golden image directed in honor of the king. Boys that set this trap peeking out there, they said, Yep, there they are. They're standing up there. Here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're just standing there. Everybody else is bowing. You don't have to get, go along to get along. Let me tell you, you don't have to go along with this world. The world's looking at us like never before. Presbyterian amen right there would be good. Somebody runs over to the king. Oh, king, them three Hebrew boys you favor, they not bowing. What do you mean they're not bowing? Nope, oh, everybody's bowing. Bring them here. King looked at him and said, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they tell me you didn't bow. We didn't bow. King said, well, what's the matter? You didn't get the email. Nobody texted you. Was your cell phone dead? That's excuses we make today. No, sir. Nothing wrong with our cell phones. Never think. Why aren't you bowing? We can't bow. We serve the living God. We're not serving up. We're not going to bow to nobody else. We can't bow. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, don't you know we're going to stoke this fire up seven times hotter and we're going to throw you in there alive if you don't bow? Then the king, I think this is Daniel chapter 3, somewhere in verse 17, and the king asked him this stupid question. Is your God able? Is your God going to deliver you out of a, the fiery furnace? Oh, how they answered. You know what they said? We don't know. We don't know if he's going to deliver us or not. We might burn up today. But I want you to know one thing, O king. Our God is able. He may not heal me, but he's able. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? He may not heal you, but he's able. God is able to do all things. He's capable and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, let me make one thing clear. The God we serve is able, and that statue you've got erected there is not able to do nothing. Amen. Our God is able. Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody said, well, what, is that a lack of faith? No, it's not a lack of faith. They didn't burn. They got thrown in the fiery furnace. But guess who was in the fiery furnace with them? You might go to the fiery furnace, but I promise you, if you're a child of God, you won't go alone. He'll pull vault out of heaven into your fiery furnace, amen. It blew the king's mind. The king said, what, look, what is going on there? Didn't we throw three? Yes, sir. There's a fourth man, and the king said he looks like the son of God. Even the heathen know who him is, uh, Amen. Our God is able, qualified, skilled, capable. But Paul's not finished. He says, now unto him who's able to do. I underscored that word do. Diana didn't do. <laughs> Somebody said, that's not proper English. I don't really care. I hardly ever used proper English. It took me 69 years to develop this, and I'm not going to blow it now. <laughs> Diana, the temple was destroyed three times. The last time it destroyed, her image was destroyed. Diana never did anything. People just come flooding into her. When she'd get broke, they'd fix her. When her house burned down, they'd, one time it was burned down deliberately. They'd scrape off the ashes and they'd rebuild her. Let me tell you something. He rebuilds me. I don't rebuild him. He don't need me to prop him up. I need him to prop me up. This, this, and Diana was a myth. That word do means God is active in our lives. You might be facing something tonight, but I promise you God is active in your life right now. God is doing something in your life right now. God is planning and mapping out the way out of this thing for you right now. He's not sitting able, idly by. Unto him who's able to do. Then he goes a little further. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. The Lord, Google again. Oh, I love Google. 
unusual. Everybody look at your neighbor and say unusual. Unusual degree. He's capable, he's able, he's skilled, but now he has unusual degree of skill. To do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. You ever get amazed? Man's mind is a wonderful thing. It's a strange thing. Sometimes I'm bored and it's not hunting season. It's too hot to fish. And I, so I'm watching a little TV and go flipping through and they have some of these programs where they show the inventions of things. Then they show some of these factories that are putting out stuff, you know. Just I'm thinking, man, somebody... Somebody had an imagination because it all starts right up here. We were, we were at the house a while back. My sister-in-law, uh, sister and brother-in-law Raymond was, was here. Matter of fact, we got a text a while ago. They'll be there when we get home. And uh, we, I was thumbing through the channels. I hate commercials, don't you? They are nothing but an interruption. And uh, I slipped to there, and Raymond said, whoa, 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 I said, what is it? He said, that's Star Wars. I said, he said, oh, I love Star Wars. Don't you? I said, what would a redneck like me want to do watching Star Wars? <laughs> when there's gun smoke on two other channels, in the Virginian and Cheyenne. Big Valley, fistful of dollars for a few dollars more. I said, no. He said, David, you never watched Star Wars? He said, I said, no. He said, none of them? I said, none of them. So I'm a good host. I back it up, and there was Star Wars. But I got to looking. He cared about the program. I got to looking. Who thought of this stuff? That was a monkey driving a spaceship. I mean, there's some weird looking character. Who, who thought of this? Sure, let's have Star Wars, but let's have human beings starring. One coming out, gang, gang, gong, 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 gong. I said, Raymond, you're 70 years old. I'm only 69. I don't like Star Wars. But the imagination. Thinking it up. I thought about this on the way over here. Debbie always drives when we're going somewhere where I can look at notes. Yeah, I got notes. I study. <laughs> I know you don't believe it, but I do. She drives, I drive home. And I got thinking about imagination, and I thought, Garmin. Who ever thought up that? They can tell you where to turn before you get there. And the frustrating thing is, but brother, when I'm driving, I got two women giving me directions. <laughs> it's more than a man can bear. But have you ever thought about how did they think this up where they could invent a little old screen on your dash of your vehicle talking to you? They can't pronounce one street in South Georgia, but they still talk to you. I said, imagination. Paul said, now unto him who is able, skilled, capable, qualified, to do exceedingly unusual degree that that God, Him, is able to do more than you can even fathom in your mind He's able to do. 
That's why we can ask him for the impossible stuff and the big stuff. I'm, I'm trying to hurry. I promise I got farther to drive than y'all. I stopped in Folsom and got me a BTL that's out there in the vehicle. I'm going to eat it on the way home. <laughs> I got supper right. See, I'll think ahead. If that boy preaches a long time, I still got supper. I go to Genesis chapter 5. God speaks to Abraham. Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, who only begotten son whom thou lovest. It's like God just turning the screw. I want you to take your only son, the one that you love. I want you to take him to a place I'll tell you, and I want you to give him as a burnt sacrifice. I don't have time to go into what a burnt sacrifice is, but it is the most gruesome thing you can read about. I want you to take your own son, your only son. If you don't know the truth about it, I'd have ignored that. I'd have pretended my phone was unplugged. I didn't get that email. Give one of my children up. Don't look at me like a bullfrog batting his eyes in a hell storm. You'd let the whole world go to hell before you'd give up one of your children. But God said, I want to save the world from hell, and I'm going to give up my son. But he asked Abraham to do it. I've read that a number of times, I promise. I never read where Abraham went and talked to Sarah about it. Can you imagine going to Kelly and say, I'm going to take one of our sons. Which one do you want me to take up there on that mountain? And I won't, I'm going to give him as a sacrifice to God. You wouldn't have the hair on your head you got right now if that was to happen. I promise you. <clears throat> Abraham didn't go to Sarah. Of course, the men back then run the thing. <laughs> Not now. We'd rather be happy than right. He didn't argue with God. He didn't say, God, but you're against human sacrifice. The heathen does that. God, well, you, you, you're against that. No, he didn't do anything. He went and got his men. He went and got the wood. He went and got the knife. And he got Isaac. Yonder they go. Three-day journey. Three days to back out. But he's not backing out. And they get to the foot of the mountain. Verse 22, he said, y'all stay right here. This is my sermon now. Y'all stay right here. Me and the lad going up yonder. And we're going to worship. And we're going to come back. Somebody said, well, that sounds like Abraham's about to back out of this thing. No, read the rest of the story. He gets up there and he straps Isaac down with ropes, gets the firewood, gets the dagger in his hand. He's over his son. He's about to stab him with that knife. And you know the story God calls out, out, of, uh, uh, calls out his name. Turns and there's a ram in the bushes. This is just a little insert in this sermon. When you're going up on one side of the mountain, God's going up on the next side of the mountain. I always remember that. And God's got his own sacrifice slung over his shoulder. He's just going to meet you up there. Abraham was going to do it. Well, the Bible tells me why Abraham was going to do it. You go to Hebrews chapter 11. Verse number 19, because Abraham accounted God faithful that he was able to even raise him up from the dead. Somebody said, well, that, that's just kind of exciting. But no, no, no. Let me just tell you the, the weight of this thing. We've heard of God raising people from the dead. I know a man in Statonville, Eccles County, that his preacher's son prayed and God set him up from the dead and he lived long enough to pray this plan of salvation. God raises third world countries are seeing this thing happen. We may, we may not. But the thing about it is Abraham had no commentary. 
Nobody in Abraham's knowledge had ever been raised up from the dead. But Abraham thought in his mind, this God is able to do extraordinary, unusual degree that if I kill my son, God is able to raise him from the dead. You may not have commentary, but I'll tell you this. God is able, and if you'll just believe him, he'll do big things in your life. Abraham said, I never, nobody ever told me God could do that. He just said, I got a promise I can't say. God promised this boy is going to be seed. It's like the stars of the sky. God's not going to break his promise. I'm going to give him to God, but God's going to raise him back up from the dead and keep his promise. So we understand but all this hinges, I'm hurrying, all this hinges on this. According to the power that worketh within us. He's talking about our faith. Mark 9 and 23, he said to him, he said, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that believe. What am I saying? Uh, this God that is able to do unusual degree. This God that is qualified. This God who is skilled. This God who is able. He will be released when we release our faith in Him and put our trust in Him. He will do great things. Amen. That power is within us. Amen. Habakkuk 2, 4, Galatians 3, 11, Hebrews 10, 38, Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith. I might not can see what tomorrow holding up, but I know who holds tomorrow. And if I'll just put my faith and just keep walking forward, uh, God's going to do something. But, brother, you have not told us who him is. Uh, I've tried to describe him, but he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's indestructible. You cannot describe him. He has no beginning of days. He has no ending of days. Uh, he has no weight. He has no measure. He, there is none to equal him to or compare him to. Uh, but I'll tell you this, he's the, he's the king of heaven. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of glory. I'll tell you this, he is self-sufficient. He does what he wants, when he wants, and he asks nobody for opinions or advice. He is a sufficient savior. He is the greatest phenomenon that ever walked across the universe. Uh, he is so majestic that he can uh, guide the stars in their orbit while watching a little insignificant sparrow fall to the ground. Uh, he is a key to wisdom. He is the gateway to glory. He is the pathway to paradise. Uh, his love is unmeasurable. His grace is sufficient. Uh, let me tell you something. He can heal the sick. He can open the blinded eyes. He can raise up the dead. Uh, he can cure incurable diseases. Uh, there is no end to him. Uh, let me tell you this. The, when you meet him, you can't get him out of your mind uh, and you can't get him off your hands. Uh, the Pharisees couldn't stand him. The Sadducees despised him. Pilate couldn't find no fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. The grave couldn't hold him. Death couldn't sting him. Let me tell you, if you're looking for fragrance, he's the rose of Sharon. If you're looking for beauty, he's the lily of the valley. If you're looking for answers, he's the solution. If you need a companion, he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. If you're lonely, he's your companion. If you're lost, he's the way. If you're stumbling in darkness, he's the light of the world. If you're thirsty, he's living water. If you're hungry, he's the bread of life. Hallelujah. I'm trying to tell you about him, about him right now. Let me tell you his name. His name is Jesus. Now unto Jesus, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Oh, his name, what a wonderful name he has. Hebrews 4 and 1, 
that tells us that he has received by inheritance a greater name than the angels. Uh, Philippians 2, 9, starting, it said that God has also highly exalted him, uh, that at the name of Jesus every knee's going to bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and under the earth. Let me tell you something. When you say Jesus, something starts happening. Uh, when you say Jesus, demons back up. Hell begins to tremble. When you say Jesus, good things is about to come your way. I'm here to tell you his name is above every name. And there's power and there's authority in that name. And he says, when you need it, use it. Amen. When you need it, use it. In my name, you shall cast out devils. In my name, you shall speak with new tongues. In my name, you'll lay hands on the sick. In my name, you could drink deadly things. Let me tell you something. There's something about him, and his name is Jesus. Somebody said with me, Jesus. Somebody said one more time, Jesus. His name is Jesus. Amen. Oh, not a sweeter name I knew than the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Stand with me. You look like you had enough of this. I wish I was younger. I'd preach 30 more minutes. We go through struggles and battles. I got this thing I do every morning without fail. I live out in the country. Only people that are around me is Debbie's family, and they all know I'm crazy anyway. They don't like me. I don't like them, so it don't matter. <laughs> I walk outside and say, Devil, look who's standing here. Look who's about to get in this pickup truck and go hunting. This morning, I said, Devil, Look who's standing here. I get to go preach tonight. You lose again. <laughs> Woo. I'm not going to tell you why I tell him that every morning, but I do. I just started doing that the last couple months. I walked out on my porch, one, and it just flowed out of me one time. I've been doing it every morning. You know why? Because of him. Him. I don't know. I just feel like some people in here need prayer. I just believe that the Lord give me this little old sermon that I could come in here and encourage you that Him is able. Don't matter what you're going through. Don't matter what that doctor said. Don't matter about that boss man. Don't matter what that kid's doing right now. I like what Pastor said a while ago. We need to just take a break from all that stuff. Just cast it on Jesus. You're here tonight. I'm not talking to everybody. I know that. My prayer was today, Pastor, that God, if you'll just let me bless one person, I'll be, be worth the time and the trip. One person. I'm done with trying to impress people with preaching. Please don't take me wrong on this. I know how to preach. I've been doing it over 40 years. I know how to preach. I'm a professional preacher. Don't get me wrong. I'm not boasting here. There's a professional preacher. He knows how to preach. I don't want to preach no more. I want to minister. Whatever days I've got left, I want to minister. I didn't come up here to impress you tonight. I come in here to bless you tonight. My mission from now on, if I'm preaching to six or 600 or whatever, I want to bless somebody. I want God to put something in my spirit that somebody can leave. Say, I'm going to win this battle. He come on.